see right now. Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're trying out a different system today, as you have noticed. So I was a bit disappointed by the big blue button system uh, that we tried out on Tuesday. So instead we're using a okay. Instead we're using a, a live lecture on YouTube. I don't know if I, if I hear you. I still have some people sitting in the background that are testing it. So once I get confirmation, I'll, I'll continue. There's no audio. I'm not trying. So one of the issues with the stream is that there's some latency. Yeah. It works very well. It works for you. Is it all everything is perfect? Okay, let's go. Okay, okay. So I yeah. that everything is uh, perfect. So we're gonna get started. Um, today's the second lecture. Uh, I'm gonna talk about static organization. So the normal setup is that we have project sessions on Tuesday and lectures on Thursday, so today. Of course in the first week that would be a little bit funny to start with the project session, so I'm doing two lectures instead. Uh, today's lecture will be a bit more focused on the project that you'll be uh, uh, receiving uh, probably at the end of today and start working on uh, in, at least in the next uh, project session. And that will be on static conversation. So what I want to do today is uh, partly I would like to rehearse um, I think I have my slides a little bit in the wrong order. Yeah, okay. Seems to work. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, so the first thing I'd like to do is to give a bit of a refresher of the final development method. As I've emphasized in the previous lecture, uh, this is assumed to be known. Still, I'll, uh, I'll refresh some of the core concepts to the extent that we'll use it. Uh, and secondly, so I, I suspect it will take about half an hour. After that, I'm gonna talk about static conversation. Uh, what is it? When would you use it? Uh, I'll, I'll use a very small uh, analytical example and then I'll generalize it to uh, how you would use this in computational models. Uh, and how is this still used in practice? Because this, uh, as I'll show in a second, this is a pretty old technique and we're still using this in, in, in some, some context. Uh, and then at the last uh, section of this lecture, I'll talk about the project session and I'll, I'll, I'll show the code that I'll, I'll hand out today. And again, that will be a, a MATLAB code and that code is going to be the basis for all of the, the subsequent four uh, assignments and, and potentially also on the, the fifth, the large assignment. Uh, and in throughout all this project, that code is sort of developing, so you get a, a larger code base every, every time and you'll have to implement some of your own code uh, in that. Then I'll, I'll talk about what exactly the project, the project is. Okay, then, um, I want to give a bit of a historic context, uh, both in terms of finite element uh, uh, technologies, and the mathematics behind that, and, and also where static condensation fits in. So here we have a bit of a timeline, and we see that the timeline goes back pretty far, all the way to the 1800s. Um, this is when a large part, the core of the mathematical theory was derived. And at that point they wouldn't call this a finite element method yet and they had no idea about computers at the time. So they were doing this with different ideas in mind, different, different objectives, but that is still the core of, of the theory that underlines what we're using uh, right now. So then if we, uh, if we skip uh, ahead a little bit, then uh, we see that uh, the first commercial computers uh, they occurred in 1955. Of course, the first computers are a little older than this, so this is when, uh, when, when uh, companies could, could buy uh, these computers. Yeah, so a bit of a historic note here. In this picture, this is actually a picture from 1955, and that's a picture of uh, Alan Turing. Okay, um, so it was also roughly around this time, and maybe a few years later, that engineers picked up the approach of, of, of developed, almost independently of the mathematical basis at that time, developed the finite element method as, a, as, a, as an approach of being able to compute uh, these um, mechanical systems. Yeah, so this is, 
very, very quickly or very shortly after the introduction of the first computers uh, that this was already, already used. And of course, at that time, there was at a very, very small scale. Um, and it was also, yeah, okay, so now I'm skipping ahead in time a little bit, uh, because the computers at that time were, were so, uh, I want to emphasize how, how the, the lack of power compared to what we're used to right now. So 15 years after the introduction of the finite element method, you would have supercomputers. And those supercomputers, as I said, uh, put on the slide, they, they have a, a computing power of 160 megaflops and their, uh, their memory RAM uh, is about 8 MB. Now the smartphones that we have nowadays, uh, of course, they have uh, close to, I would say, 20 times the amount, no, I wrote this down, probably 100, yeah, yeah. So they have 100 times the computational power of the supercomputers of 1975 uh, and close to 200 times the amount of RAM or, or more. Right, so the supercomputers of 1975, um, they are outshined by our, our smartphones nowadays, and the finite element method was introduced yet 50 years before those supercomputers. So they were really working with extremely uh, low, low scale computing power. And study colonization kind of fits in between there. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, static colonization kind of fits in between there. So static colonization, when it was introduced, was a technique of reducing the size of these computational models, such that they could actually use them in the computers uh, that they had at the time. And the idea here is, uh, so suppose that you have a, a very highly detailed uh, model, in this case of the Eiffel Tower, and the idea is that instead of computing all the degrees of freedom in this model, which might be hundreds of thousands, millions, now back in the day they wouldn't be working with uh, models of this scale, but the idea stands. So rather than computing all those degrees of freedom, what we want to do is compute a subset of degrees of freedom. And we do not want to do that, as I'm showing in the, the picture on the right, we do not want to do that by simply lumping together uh, all, the, all the elements into, uh, into simplified elements. So we don't want to uh, reduce the number of elements per se. We just want to compute a subset of the degrees of freedom while taking into account the information of that complete detailed model. And that's what static colonization is about. So static colonization is a technique of pulling out pretty much the, the blue dots, these guys, out of the, the matrix system of equation and only computing these while taking into account the fidelity of the complete model. Yeah. So, what this is, this is pretty much simply a matrix manipulation scheme. Okay, and uh, during the project sessions, you'll be implementing uh, this uh, static colonization procedure for a particular application. So, I wrote a small finite element code. And what I want to do today, to a large extent, is talk about how the finite element method works. So as we saw in the previous slide, there's pretty much two streams that at some point came together. Um, a long time ago, there was already a, the mathematical basis was already being developed. Um, at the time, they were not calling it finite elements. Uh, the finite element method was coined somewhere in the mid-1960s, I believe, from the engineering perspective. Yeah, so those are two streams, and they look at things that are from a different perspective, but they also come together at some point, and that's the point of uh, variational formulation. And that's the perspective from which I would like to, to introduce the finite element method. So normally if we, if we take a class on finite element methods, you would start from, uh, from a beam structure, write a matrix set of equations from that and, and continue from there. That's not the road I'm going to take, as I'll assume this is, is prior knowledge, and I'll, I'll sort of jump somewhere in the middle. So, what is our objective? Suppose that we have some sort of continuum body. And this would be a solid for, for our applications. And this body might be clamped at certain points, so it might have a zero displacement here. And we might have some, some traction, some forces that are applied on the boundary. And it might also be a, a body force yeah, that's acting everywhere. And Based on these forces and boundary conditions, this body will deform. Yeah, so I might consider deformation 
looks something like like this, right? So it's clamped over there. That's not where it's going to deform. It might deform something like I don't know. That that could be the shape of a deformed body. And now the objective that we have is we want to compute the displacement. Yeah? So each point in the original body has a new point in the deformed body associated to it, and that is a displacement. And our objective is to compute those, the, that displacement field. Yeah? So the question that we're trying to answer is, what is that displacement field? And from mechanical theory, we know that uh, the displacement field for this body in equilibrium will be that for which uh, the internal energy is minimized. So that is uh, the, the, the physical law that we're going with. Yeah? So this will be a displacement field that minimizes the internal energy. This is this displacement field that minimizes the internal energy. And we've done this in multiple classes, um, and this shows up in multiple, multiple ways. Uh, I think I got taught uh, Castellanos theorem, and we have virtual forces, virtual displacement. That all falls into the same category. Yeah? That uh, body in equilibrium will be displaced in such a way that minimizes this internal energy. So, what is an expression for the internal energy? Well, as we know from our mechanic, mechanics classes, if I have some infinitesimal uh, energy at some, some location, that will be half of the stress, to the strain, times that differential volume. Now, of course, we have a constitutive relation that links the stress and the strain together via some, some sort of stiffness tensor. And if we combine those, then we get an expression for the internal energy and that only depends on the strain. And I'll reshuffle this a little bit. Uh, we know that the strains, the stresses that are symmetric uh, and also the, the stiffness tensor has these minor and major symmetries uh, and that permits me to rewrite this in the following way. So this is an infinitesimal energy, the complete energy in the body, that's the energy that will be minimized, that will be the integral of that infinitesimal energy. Over the complete volume. So our objective is to find the displacement. Uh, this is now an expression in terms of strains. Now, of course, we also have a, a link between uh, stresses and strains. Those are kinematic relationships. Uh, and that says that, for at least for small strains, that's the assumption that we'll be making, is that epsilon is equal to half of the gradient of the displacement field. So this would be a vector field uh, plus tangential of that gradient. So the gradient of a vector is, is a second order tensor, so if I write this out in, in uh, index notation for clarity, then you'd get ui yeah, and partial xj plus partial uj partial xi. And I'll write this a little, uh, in a little different notation using simply the symmetric gradient yeah, for simplicity. Which means that at this point I'm able to, uh, to write my internal energy as an integral purely involving that unknown field, a displacement field. 
Okay. And by the way, if there's any questions, I have someone sitting uh, sitting here looking at the chat, so feel free to, to type something up. So, so one comment was that you need to be careful about the white corner. Because there's your is the red deck. corner, is the clear corner not there? Yeah. No, yeah, because you, know, you can see. It's a bit overlapping, the picture of the board. Oh, yeah. So maybe okay. you need to be careful. Okay, 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 I'll be careful, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for the comment. Okay. Mm. Yeah, okay, so this is the total internal energy in our system uh, based on a, a displacement field. And the solution that we're looking for, the U that we're looking for, is some function that minimizes that expression. So we're looking for the solution U for which E, which is a function of U, is minimized. So this point E is what we call a functional, in the sense that it, uh, it takes a function and it, it spits out uh, a value. As you can see, this is an integral equation, so it takes a function u and the result is a number. That's a functional. So a minimization of a functional works a little differently than it does for a minimization of a function. So a minimization of a function would be the point where the derivative is zero. Now, of course, the derivative of a functional is uh, slightly more tricky to define. To define, um, we'd have to define. We could either go with a variational uh, formulation, so that we take the first variation, uh, and in what the notation that I prefer, we're using uh, the Gateau derivative, and that is the, the the solution that is characterized as the minimal solution. Uh, that would be the point where. If I take, yeah, okay, so I'm going to vary my, my internal energy E with some small uh, change. And that gives me E of U plus epsilon V. And epsilon is a very, very small number, and V might be any function. So the idea is I'm going to uh, look for the solution U. And in such a way that if I change u a little bit with epsilon times v, then uh, the derivative in that direction will be zero. Yeah? And the notation for that is that at this point we can take the derivative with respect to epsilon because that's now a single number and we know how to take derivatives of numbers, of, of uh, scalar functions. And this will be at the point where epsilon is very, very small and specifically epsilon is equal to zero. Yeah, so this expression, this characterizes the, the displacement field U as a minimizer of our functional that is the internal energy. So we can simply uh, work this out. Um, so if I write this out, I would get that the, the epsilon... And I'll substitute U plus epsilon V in the expression for the internal energy. And what I would get is the integral over v of half gradient s of u plus epsilon v. u plus epsilon v. And if I'll be a little bit more careful with my dvs, I'll we'll have a dv there. And this is evaluated at the point where epsilon is equal to zero. Okay. So we can expand this. Um, I think I'll go to a new slide for that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll expand that expression. And that gives me the following components. So again, I have d, d epsilon of the integral of the volume of half uh, symmetric gradient of u symmetric gradient of u plus now a volumetric term that has half times the symmetric gradient of epsilon v 
So I'm going to get into view. Plus. U, C, Epsilon V, plus Epsilon V, C, symmetric gradient of Epsilon V. Okay, and um, I should actually emphasize that uh, the, the point where uh, u is minimized is where this derivative is equal to zero. Yeah? So it, in, the, in a very analogous sense to how we take the derivative or how we set the derivative to zero of a function, that would be a minimization point. Yeah? So again, this has to be zero. Okay. And it actually has to be zero for any possible solution v. So for any for any function v, this expression has to be zero. If that is the case, then use a function that minimizes our internal energy. So what can we do with these terms? Well, we're taking a derivative with respect to epsilon. Uh, there's no epsilon in the first term, so that guy already drops out. And the second term is linear with respect to epsilon. There's only one factor of epsilon, epsilon in there. We could pull that out all the way up front in the, uh, in, the, in the integral and it's simply linear with respect to epsilon. So the derivative of something that is linear with respect to that quantity, uh, the quantity factors out. The same thing holds for the third term. And the fourth term is quadratic in epsilon. So we would have to do sort of a, a, a product rule here. Uh, and in all cases, you would still end up with a factor of epsilon in there. And since epsilon will end up being zero, will be set to zero, that whole term also drops out. Yeah? So the first and last term simply drop out, and the, the, the second and the third, uh, they, they stay. And we can actually combine those. Uh, so at this point, what we're left with is that we have the integral over the volume of, and I'll, I'll just write this out one more time, and then we'll simplify it. C u plus the integral over the volume of half symmetric gradient of u, c symmetric gradient of u. And again, we have all these symmetries here. We have the symmetric operators, the symmetric gradients. Uh, we have our stiffness uh, tensor that is also symmetric. So these terms. Uh, in excitation actually turn out to be the same, so we can add those together, that's why we get rid of the factor of a half. And this is simply a v. Yeah? And this is the expression that has to be zero for any possible v. And if that is the case, then u is a minimizer. So this is what we now call a variational formulation. And this is also the basis of a finite element method. So our finite element methods are based out of this characterization of the solution that we are interested in. Now how does that work then? Okay, so our objective is to find some function u such that that integral quantity is equal to zero for all v. Now, which functions are, are, are we permitting to look at here? In principle, any function, if I, uh, if I may uh, simplify. So we're looking for, and I can, I, can pretty much, I can create sort of a set of functions, which I'll, I'll call capital U. And that is a large collection of functions. So U is a large collection of functions. 
that we uh, that we permit or that we that we are searching and in principle this is not only a large collection of functions this is actually an infinitely large connection yeah so there's infinitely many functions in here Okay, and I'll talk about these, de these details will become important in future lectures, so I'll actually rehearse part of this from a different perspective, from a more mathematical perspective, and we'll, then we'll talk about exactly how we define and characterize these, uh, these function spaces, is what we call them at that point, U is a function space, or a collection of functions. But for now I want to sort of keep this vague, and we'll just call this a collection of functions that we, we are somehow uh, searching in. And this could be all kinds of functions. It could be uh, sines, cosines, exponentials, uh, polynomials. And in principle, this is infinite dimensional. Now, infinite dimensional doesn't uh, work very well for us, uh, especially if we're working with computers. Computers cannot work with infinitely many degrees of freedom. You could look at these as degrees of freedom. So we somehow have to collapse this large collection into something that is finite dimensional. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to sample a couple of functions for which we say those might be good candidates uh, and, and that is how we create our collection of functions. Yeah? So we will change our infinite dimensional or our infinitely large collection of functions into a, a subset. And this is a subset. And this is now finite dimensional. So what could these functions look like? Again, what I could do is I could uh, put signs in there, I could put a sign of x, I could put in the sign of 2x, of 3x, uh, that would be sort of a Fourier idea, um, th that could work. Um, the idea we normally take is that we want to have functions that somehow localize, that uh, simplifies our, our, our code later on, that uh, simplifies integration. Um, and what I could do is I could draw some, some examples for a particular case, so suppose that we're not interested in a, a 2D body, but in a, a, 1D, uh, a 1D body. So this is simply a rod, which is clamped on the left, and we have a certain load on the right. And to be consistent, I'll still call this a T. We might still have sort of a body force that's also pulling in that direction. Or maybe in the other direction. Yeah. So I, uh, this is a, a 1D example in this case, so this would now be if we have uh, x from 0 to, to L, then our variational statement uh, would become that the integral from 0 to L of, and now we have um, 1 effective stiffness EA, uh, so you get EA times DX, there's only one derivative right now of u times d dx of v that that guy has to be and it, okay so this the zero is in case let me um, let me think about this um, so the zero is of course if you have zero body forces um, yeah I would like to keep it simple so I'm going to stick to the zero uh, so suppose that we have set a set displacement here. Yeah, so we, we set a displacement. So we have a displacement u right there. We're going to say all of these are zero. Yeah, so then we're looking for the zero. Okay, so we're prescribing a displacement on the right hand side. Um, and then our, our, our variational statement simplifies to that. So what might be a smart idea of creating this bag of functions? Well, the way that we typically do that for our finite element methods is that we create these hat functions. This is one function that we consider, n1. This is another function that we consider, n2. It's another one, n3. Yeah? So we have a bunch of these hat functions all the way until the end. This would be n, and I'll call this n. And now we're going to say that the collection of functions 
H, and H here uh, indicates that this is uh, a discrete representation, a, a subset, a finite dimensional case. And that will be now the span of all these basis functions. And the span in this case means that any linear combination of these basis functions is allowed. Yeah? So this is a, a, a collection of functions of all the possible linear combinations of these components. So that means that uh, any function that we might consider, u, and I'll also add a, a superscript h on that to indicate that this is a finite element solution, a discrete representation, would be written as the sum, the linear combination, the sum of these basis functions multiplied by coefficients. It's a linear combination, and these coefficients will be denoted with a hat. And these are all the possible functions that we will allow, and that's all we're, we're going to look for. So those are all these guys. Similarly, what we can do is we can write for our test functions, right? These are the visa now the test functions. That we also permit linear combinations of our basis functions. So with this technique, we have changed something that works in physical reality. This is an infinite dimensional case into something that is finite dimensional, but that we can solve with a computer. Now, how do we do this uh, solving technique? What, what do we continue doing at this point? Well, we're going to simply replace our solution here by the finite, dim the finite dimensional case. And again, this should now be true for all functions v in that finite dimensional space. Yeah, and just to be clear, this symbol means uh, in. This is, uh, so now v is a member of, of this, this collection uh, uh, the in symbol. Oh, and this is the for all symbol. Yeah? So I'm already introducing some notation to simplify my writing. So how does this end up being a finite element method, and specifically how do we get a stiffness matrix from this? Well, we can simply substitute. So let me rehearse. We have um, e a d d x of u, h d d x of v, and we're going to substitute this, uh, the fact that u h is a linear combination of nodal values of, uh, of weighting, weighting uh, coefficients times basis functions. We're going to substitute that in there. What that ends up being for both, for both our solution, uh, and the test function, v, and that gives us something like this. Okay. Now the way that we can write this sum is as a matrix or a vector times a vector. Yeah, so I could write this as a vector of v1, v2, vn times a vector of n1, oh, sorry, n1 of x, all the way to n, n of x. And the same thing for this guy. So I'll call this v hat bar, because it's a vector, and I'll call this n x underscore, and this will be the transpose And similarly, and I'll swap this around actually. So at this point, these are scalars, I can swap that around, no problem. And for u, what I'll do is I will do the same matrix 
vector-vector uh, vector multiplication, but I'll swap uh, uh, the, uh, the, the basis functions. And the nodal values, the coefficients. Yeah, and now we're calling this one uh, u hat underscore. And this is simply the transpose of nx. So that uh, removes the, the, uh, those sums. What I would get is ea. And as I said, I'll swap those. So what I get is v hat t times n of x. Oh, sorry, and there's still derivatives in here. I lost my derivatives. Yeah, so, and uh, all these, uh, the, the coefficients here, they are, they are not dependent on, on, on space, so the derivatives don't act over there. So this ends up, the derivatives can shift over to our vector of basis functions. And then the second one, again, this, the derivative shifts over to the vector basis function, so you get nx t times u hat. Yeah, I believe that's correct now. Okay, um, now in, sim in, the similar, in the similar way as that the derivatives only act on the vectors of basis function, because those are the only ones that are spatially dependent, we can also pull these vectors, this one and this one, out of the integral, because again there's no spatial relation there. So what you end up with is v hat t e a d dx of n of x times d dx of n t of x u hat. And that should be able to equal to zero in order to characterize this as a function or as a solution. And again, this has to be uh, equal to zero for all possible v, which means for all functions uh, v hat, or for all vectors of coefficients. And this will be our stiffness matrix. This is what we call K. Now at this point I haven't made any separation into elements, this will be a global integral, so this is a complete uh, volume. Now the nice thing about the way that we chose our basis functions is that they all have this local support, and these will be our elements. Yeah? So this will be one element, one element, another element, etc. And the reason for doing so is, or one of the reasons for doing so, is that precisely this large integral, it splits. And it splits over now a sum of these elements. And for each of these elements, you could, oh sorry, uh, yeah. This gets a little tricky. Let me call this simply from I. Uh, J, I'll call it J. And for each of these elements, we would have to perform this operation. And this operation now becomes very, very cheap because they, these, these basis functions are local. Yeah, so n1 and n20, um, they are not connected uh, and their contributions will be zero. So you have very localized uh, uh, connections. So each of these integrals is only going to create a, a matrix with a, a very localized contribution, and those are the element stiffness matrices. So and the way that you would write a code, and I'll show this later, is that uh, you actually loop over each element, and each element you create uh, the stiffness matrix that is uh, the relevant integration at each of these elements, and then you compile that, you assemble that into the global, uh, the global k. Um, and the integration procedure, that is going to be by a numerical integration, that would be a Gauss point, uh, a Gauss rule, for instance. Um, so, I wanted to kind of illustrate these points, 
uh, because we'll be using this, we'll also be changing this, so this is uh, um, rather general, it's might be different from what you have seen before, but this is uh, general in the sense that we can at this point change these basis functions into any shape that we want. Yeah? So another way of deriving something similar is that you have um, small volumes that are stretched. And that doesn't work anymore if you change your basis functions by a sign function. That interpretation doesn't work anymore. The interpretation of having small basis functions that are weighted by a coefficient that translate over to, to any other situation. And we'll be changing that situation, so that's why I want to emphasize this perspective of this approach. Yeah, okay, so and I'll show uh, a code example in, in a little bit, and then, then hopefully this, uh, the details here will be, will be clear. Yeah? Okay. okay, so that means I'll, I'll talk now about uh, the thing that uh, relates more to the project, and that is the static condensation. And I'll explain static condensation starting from a trivially simple example, as it says here. And this example will be so simple that it's almost laughable, um, but the sets of steps will be exactly the same once we translate this idea to the complete matrix system of equations that is the finite element method. So right now it might look extremely simple, we'll use the exact same steps uh, later on. So the example that we'll look at is that we have uh, these two roads, they're connected, um, we have a displacement uh, after the first rod and we have a displacement after the second rod. Then there will be loads, we have an F1 and an F2. And each of these rods have an effective st uh, stiffness. Um, okay, so this is a two degree of freedom system. We have the degree of freedom that is U1 and the degree of freedom that is U2. Now suppose that, and I could compute both of those, so how would I go about doing that? Um, well, first of all, we have here the relation that is uh, the general relation between the, the load and the, the strain. And if we rewrite the strain as a change in displacement over a length, then we get the, the, the relation between any load and a dis uh, displacement. Which, which we can specifically write for RF2. Um, which is equal to the, the, the delta u being the difference between u1 and u2 and the stiffness now is the stiffness in that member yeah, so that gives us an expression for f2 um, on this beam we can do something similar we take the stiffness of that beam we have now a u1 as our delta u because the left side has a zero displacement and the load that is acting on this side is the sum of f1 and f2 yeah, so we have two expressions and we can, we can create a matrix system of equations for that um, as follows. Yeah? So I, from, from here I, I subtract this expression from this expression to give me that. So that now I have an expression for F2 and for F1 uh, depending on U2 and U1. And I can create the, the matrix system of equation out of that. So that's the system of equation that we're working with. And this is a system of equation that given an F1 and an F2, given those loads, I'll be able to solve this for our displacements. That's the idea. Now suppose, however, that I'm not interested in all displacements. The only one that I'm interested in is the tip uh, displacement, the one at the end, so U2. Suppose that all I'm interested in is U2. So I don't want to compute U1. How would I go about doing that? Okay, so what do these equations say? We have, uh, if, uh, if I, so th this will be our stiffness matrix, and we have components k11, k12, k21, and k22. So the first equation is saying k11 times u1, plus k12 times u2 is equal to f1. The second equation is saying k21 times u1 plus k22 times 
2 is equal to f1. And now my objective is to only compute u2. I only want to compute a subset of, of the degrees of freedom. So the first step that I would take is to take equation number one and rewrite this as an expression for u1 depending on u2. Yeah, so what I would do is I would say u1 is equal to f1 minus k12 u2. So I'm moving that to the right hand side and I'm, I'm dividing by k11. So the second step that I would take is now to substitute this expression for u1 in the second, in the second equation. So what does that give me? So I'm going to substitute that in there. So that gives me k21, 1 divided by k11. And I will move my f to the right hand side. I'll do that in, in one motion. So I only have the dependence on u2 here. Plus k22, u2 is equal to k21. Write this in a new line. Is equal to say f1 minus k21, 1 divided by k11 times f1. Yeah? And at this point, it's simply a matter of, of, of collecting terms. Um, these all depend on u2. So I can compile these, I would get k22 minus k21, 1 over k11, k12, u2 is equal to that guy. Yeah? So this equation gives me sort of a rewrite a new effective stiffness matrix, or a stiffness value, I'm not talking about matrices yet, that was the whole point, some effective stiffness associated my, to the, my degree, the degree of freedom 2, sorry, um, I don't want to have that hat. So. so a new effective stiffness and a new effective force. Yeah, so this is uh, the, taking into account the effect of, of the degrees of freedom that I've removed from my system of equations and in doing so I've created an effective stiffness K and an effective force F hat. So finally I would obtain my U2 as 1 over K hat times F hat. And if I work that out nicely then I would get the trivial uh, result that is now at the bottom. Yeah, my U2 would simply be this, this weighting of stiffnesses or times the forces. So again, this is a trivially simple example. And this is how you would eliminate the degree of freedom given two sets of equations. So this is, uh, and the result is also trivial. Uh, so I hope this, this the set of steps here is very clear. Now, the funny thing is that if you try and do the same thing in the matrix equation, uh, then suddenly it seems very complex, but it is precisely the same set of steps. And that's what I want to illustrate with you. So let's go now to the, the general case for static conversation for matrix problems. Yeah, so here we again have our, our Eiffel Tower that I started off with in my introduction. So this will be a, a huge um, set of equations. This will be a very large stiffness matrix if you consider each of these members, each of these beams, contributes a degree of freedom. And we're not interested in all these degrees of freedom, we're not interested in anyone in the middle. Uh, suppose that we only have a number that we're interested in, for instance, because that's where we have our measurement equipment. Yeah? So suppose that we're interested in how the Eiffel Tower responds to wind loading, and we're interested in its swaying, its deflection at the top, uh, maybe also at the center to get some, some, some idea of the, the, um, the, the bending profile and of some more important locations. And that's where we might have our measurement equipment. So rather than computing every single degree of freedom in that huge uh, system of equations, I only want to compute these blue ones. A handful of them. And again, I don't want to simplify my finite element model. I want to take the original finite element model that takes into account all the detail that that structure has, 
And then I want to rework that using matrix manipulation to only give me the results uh, for the blue division field. So how would I go about doing that? And again, this is pretty much the exact same as we just did for the trivial example. The only thing that we have to, to change to get to that point is that we have to swap some rows and colors. Yeah? So we have to, and what we're going to do is we're going to put all the, the, the degrees of freedom that we want to statically condensate, we put all of those in the bottom. Yeah, so we're moving here the row and the column associated to this guy, we're moving that all the way to the bottom and all the way to the right, and we do so for each of the rows and columns associated to each of the degrees of freedom that we're interested in. Yeah, so now we've moved all the relevant rows and columns to here. And after we have done that, we can look at this matrix now in this sense, where these are the blue degrees of freedom, and these are the orange ones. And the large stiffness matrix also divides into four components. Yeah? So each of those is, is, is still a matrix. Yeah? So these are submatrices. And now what I want to do is I want to compute only the, uh, the delta C. Now this is pretty much exactly the same setup. Is it work? Ah, yeah. The same setup as we had here, right? The only difference is that in, in here I have put values in my, in my matrix and here we have submatrices. But other than that, it's the exact same thing. We'll go through the same set of steps. So what are those steps? I wish I could go back and forth a little quicker. Um, but this was the first step in the, in the set of steps that we took in the previous slide, uh, where we're taking the first line and now we're, we're, so that's the first line, we're moving to the right, this guy, that's this, and we're multiplying by the left inverse of this matrix. Yeah? That's why we get this inverse here and this inverse here. That was the first step that we performed in our trivially simple example. So now I have an expression for delta B given delta C, and that is what I'll substitute in the second line. So now I'll substitute this into the second line, and that is the second step that we took in the, last, in the, in the previous slide. After that, we can combine delta C and the delta C, such that this becomes a new matrix, and that is our effective stiffness matrix. In the trivial example, uh, trivially simple example, we had an effective stiffness value, but now we have an effective stiffness matrix. And these guys are the effective forces. So this simply gives us a new system of equations, a new finite element system. An interesting part here is that without computing all these additional degrees of freedom that we are not interested in, we can still take their effect into account in the computed, the, the statically condensed um, degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we're taking into account all the detail of the finite element model without computing it. Yeah? And that, that information is in this effective stiffness matrix right now, yeah? via this inverse, uh, via all these cross matrices, etc. Yeah? And so here we have the definitions of the new K. That's this guy and this guy. And the new force. And the name for this matrix, this new effective stiffness matrix, because this shows up quite regularly in all kinds of applications, this is the, the sure component. Okay, um, so when might something like this be useful? Um, and I've kind of made this point in the introduction as well when I talked about reduced other models. This is not useful if you want to run a certain computation once. It might look like this is uh, now uh, much cheaper because we're only computing a subset of, equ of equations, but we've still had to invert this large matrix over here. Yeah, that's, we saw that 
So that is this matrix. So but in, in order to remove those degrees of freedom, we still had to invert the associated matrix. So this is not cheaper. And more so, we now have a couple of matrix multiplications that we have to perform. We end up with a new finite element system. And in order to solve now for delta C, we will still have to also invert this matrix. And I think you can actually prove that in terms of uh, computational expense, uh, you will not be cheaper with this approach. So that's not the objective here. The objective here is not to perform one uh, implement or one computation once. So what might be another uh, application? Suppose that we have a temporal problem, time dependent problem, where uh, we have a given wind loading and we're interested in the deflection of the Eiffel Tower over time. So you could uh, design a finite different time stepping scheme and you would have to solve a system of equations or at least uh, multiply through a, large, uh, a matrix set of equations for each time step. If you would do that for all the degrees of freedom of the entire Eiffel Tower, then that approach would be very expensive because every time step you have to solve that large system of equations. So at that point, the alternative that you could do is to perform this approach. You get a statically condensed uh, system of equations which is only involves the, uh, the degrees of freedom that you are interested in and then perform your time, uh, time stepping operation on that. Yeah, so that allows you to give a very, uh, at this point there might be, or what did I illustrate here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 10 degrees of freedom. So your new system of equation would only be 10 degrees of freedom while taking into account all the effect of the, the hundreds of thousands of additional degrees of freedom. And in your time stepping algorithm uh, that would retain the accuracy. That's what I think I want to emphasize here is you get the exact same solution for these degrees of freedom if you were to solve the large scale, the, the complete set of equations, or if you were to solve the statically condensed set of equations. And again, it's not cheaper if you do it once, it only becomes cheaper if you want to reuse that information. Now that is one uh, example. Uh, another example is if you use this technique in an approach that we call substructuring. Oh, I see that my slides got a little mangled, that's fine. Uh, so substructuring, what we do here, so when I, when I showed you the, the, the timeline, um, one interesting uh, point there is that if we compare the computational expense from a, a couple of decades ago, those first supercomputers, then we find that our uh, uh, our CPU strength has increased by a factor of 100 or, or 1000 and our memory by almost an order of magnitude more. So right now we're able to, relatively speaking, we have more memory than we did back then. And the memory was a large bottleneck back then. So the objective here was not necessarily to reduce the computational expense because as I said in, in the previous slide, that is not what this, this does. Uh, their objective was to reduce the amount of memory required, so the amount of uh, storage that they needed at every st step in their solving uh, uh, approach. And the way that they did this is by substructuring. And this is what I'll ask of you to do in the project session as well. So substructuring is what you'll do in the code. Now how does that work? What we're going to do is we're going to subdivide our structure into substructures. And so we have here one this one will be another one, here's another one, another one, and another one. So here I drew five substructures. And each of these substructures has degrees of freedom associated to it. Those are the body degree of freedoms, uh, UB. And so those are the nodes inside of that substructure. So there's UB1 associated to substructure 1 and UB2 associated to substructure 2. Now all the nodes that combine, that connect substructure 1 and substructure 2, those are the UCs, the ones that we will statically condensate. Those are called UC 1, 2, connecting 1 and 2. In a similar sense, we have here the degrees of freedom that we will statically condensate, uh, U2, 3, that are connecting substructure 2 and substructure 3. What we can do now is for each of these substructures create a matrix system of equation. Yeah, so this is the matrix system of equation associated with substructure 1, where we have our degrees of freedom in the body, UB1, and we have the degrees of freedom on 
the connecting the interface between uh, substructure 1 and substructure 2. So those are those. And so substructure 1 is purely governed. You can compute all degrees of freedom in substructure 1 from this set of equation. Similarly, you can create a, sub, uh, a system of equation associated to substructure 2. Where we have the stiffness matrices associated to the body. And now we have the cyclically con condensed degrees of freedom for both 1, 2 and 2, 3, which we're putting at the bottom of our vector. Yeah? And we can do the same for substructure 3 and for sub substructure 4. The next step in our approach is that we will statically condense, we will use our static condensation technique on this system of equations and we will only compute the statically condensed degrees of freedom 1, 2. And so we'll use the approach from the previous slide and we will statically condense only degrees of freedom that are connecting those substructures. Then we'll do the same thing for substructure number two. So this gives us a uh, system of equations for 1, 2 and for 2, 3. And we can do that also for substructure number three, substructure four and five, etc. Then um, what we'll do is we'll compile, uh, compile all of these new systems of equations into a new large stiffness matrix where we're overlapping the components for 1, 2 and 1, 2. And in this sense, we're building now a new system of equation that gives us the solution for all our statically condensed degrees of freedom. So this is a system of equation that only involves the statically condensed degrees of freedom. Now, given on, depending on, on our, um, our, our subdivision approach, so how many degrees of freedom do we put in the substructure and how many degrees of freedom do we put on the, the interface, uh, this will be uh, much, much smaller than the global system of equation that you'd have if you would try and solve the complete Eiffel Tower in one go. Moreover, we only need to store, we can iterate through each of the substructures and we only need to store at that point these smaller matrices. Rather, we can immediately throw away these big matrices. Now, so in terms of memory, at each step in the procedure, we, uh, we, we, we have um, we require much, much less memory. So now what you can do is you can solve this system of equations. That will give you the solution of the degrees of freedom over there. And again, the solution here will be the exact same compared to if you were to solve all the degrees of freedom in the complete system, in the complete avatar. Once we have those degrees of freedom, we can again iterate over each of the substructures. We can recreate, depending on how we set this up, we can recreate this system of equations. But at this point, I'll change color. At this point, these guys are known. And then we're all, and in a post-processing step, we can then compute these guys. And the approach that we'll do. Um, that will pretty, be pretty much this step right here, this equation. So that will be our post-processing equation. Huh? Because at this point we have solved for our statically condensed degrees of freedom, those are these guys, and as a post-processing within our structure, we're then able to, to compute the degrees of freedom um, that we first condensed out. Okay, so this is also uh, kind of the procedure that I'll, uh, I'll ask you to implement um, in the code that I'll send. And I, uh, I'll, depending on the time, I'll also look into that. Uh, I think the first thing that I still want to do though is kind of illustrate that this is not uh, a technique that uh, belongs in the 1960s. Uh, we're still doing this today. Um, and uh, the thing I'll illustrate here is that we'll do this for. Yeah, okay. So um, there's certain discontinuity. Okay, so there's many types of fine formulations. 
and they all differ in, in some sense. The one that we're typically familiar with is continuous colloquial methods, where our solutions will always be continuous. Yeah, so the field here is continuous. Another flavor of fine dynamic method is discontinuous colloquial, where we're permitting or allowing our solution to have jumps. Now, there's different reasons for doing so. Um, we have a different class on, on, on methods like these. Um, they're specifically beneficial for talking about fluid mechanics uh, problems. And a sub, uh, subset of these, of these methods is called the hybridized with discontinuous colloquial method. Now, what does that mean? That means precisely that we're using now static condensation and to some extent really also the substructuring technique inside of this finite element scheme. And the way that we'll do that is we'll create now additional degrees of freedom around each of our elements. And these will be the UCs from our previous slides, so the, the, the degrees of freedom that we will condense out. And this effectively creates a substructure for each of our elements. And each of our elements will have now a local block in the global stiffness matrix. And we have now these additional degrees of freedom, which are called the hybrid degrees of freedom in, in this, this theory, but they, uh, they translate to the condensed degrees of freedom um, in our substructuring approach. So this would effectively be the, the C's from the previous slides. And you can use the exact same strategy from this uh, static condensation and the substructuring from the previous uh, uh, slide. So the approach is that you first solve exclusively for these, these, these connecting um, degrees of freedom and in a post-processing step then solve for the degrees of freedom inside the element. Again, this is not cheaper in terms of computational expense. Um, in this case, it's also arguable if it's cheaper in terms of memory. So what's the benefit of doing something like this then? Well, this you can use uh, extremely well in a computing cluster. So if you have not, uh, many different um, computing cores to, to solve your uh, systems of, of equations, you might have hundreds or thousands of computers uh, running a simulation, then a bottleneck will often be the communication between the CPUs. And also in that case, the static organization and the substructuring allows you to stay on one element, on one core, and have everything disconnected from its surrounding. So also in that case, this, this approach is, to, uh, is, is still used. Yeah? So I, I don't want to emphasize any of the details here, I just want to show that even though this technique was developed in the 1960s, it is still being used today. Yeah, okay, and this is kind of what I uh, also mentioned earlier, this is still from the slide from the introduction. Um, but I would like to emphasize it again for this particular approach of reduced order modeling, because that's what this is, this is a reduced order model, and as we've seen, uh, this does not replace our discretization scheme. This is still we're still using finite elements to, to build our matrices, to to assemble, to, to, to create the element stiffness matrices, to assemble the, the large systems of equations. We use all the same theory. We go from uh, minimization principles, and after that, so this is built upon that. So after that, uh, we use our reduced order modeling technique. Yeah? So in this case, we talked about static minimization. And similarly, these are not useful, the static condensation is not useful if you're interested in solving a single uh, high fidelity solution. If you only want to compute the complete Eiffel Tower once, then it's not useful. It is only useful if you have to reuse this information in, in some sense. And so this is from the introduction I wanted to, to re reiterate on that. Okay, then I will use the last 20 minutes to uh, talk about the project. Um, Project one. Uh, so what I will give you is a MATLAB code, and this MATLAB code is uh, is it's a two-dimensional finite element code. Uh, it involves uh, a Poisson equation, so that um, Poisson equation would look something like this. Yeah. So this is the second derivatives. So that would be minus partial u. So that is the, the equation that, that we'll be solving with a finite element scheme. Now what does this relate to? This would for instance be if you have a membrane. If you would have 
Suppose you have a square and you want to stretch either a balloon or a drum surface or something like that over this membrane while there are certain obstacles in the way. Yeah? So you might want to stretch this and you might clamp it on the side, you might, might get something like that. If you clamp it on the side and the Poisson equation will give you the height of the membrane at any point in your, in your domain. That's what this equation is about. So I'll give you a, a MATLAB find end code about that. Um, this does indeed involve a square domain uh, where I have discretized using square, uh, square elements and linear basis functions. I have set clamping conditions, so Dirichlet boundary conditions on the sides and I have left the normal condition free on the top and the bottom which means that on the sides we're setting U and I think I set it to some sort of uh, trigonometric function over here and maybe I set it to zero over here and on this side we have the condition that the normal derivative the normal derivative of u is equal to 0. And the same thing over here. Yeah? So that is, uh, so that is u dot m is equal to 0. So that's the final element code that I wrote and I'll give you. And I'll, uh, depending on the time, I'll scroll through that uh, at, uh, all the way at the end. Um, and yeah, we might talk about the note numbering for a bit. So this is what, you've give, the, what you'll be given and what I want you to compute, give me back, is this guy. And as you can see, this, uh, this already sort of involves a, a substructuring technique, because effectively what you've been given is each of these substructures. Let me change my color. You've been given code that can compute each of these substructures. And what I want you to do is to implement the substructuring technique, the static condensation techniques from the previous slides. And of course, I'll upload these slides um, and do the, the, the matrix manipulation such that you effectively or that you compute now a new structure that looks like that, like this compiled set of blocks. Yeah? And of course, I'll, I'll have a, a PDF ready as well that uh, describes this problem a little better. And I'll upload that as well. Um, and in the PDF I also have a couple of steps that you'll go through in order to get this done. Okay, so then in the last 10-15 uh, minutes what I'll do is I'll switch to uh, I'll switch to my MATLAB code. Let me see. works now. Is it working, Jim? Yeah. Okay. okay, so this is the MATLAB code that I'll give you. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about this a little bit because, firstly, because it's interesting for the project, you need to know what the code does. And secondly, I think that everybody that comes from this department should have an idea of what a fine element code looks like, what it does. So I'll, I'll go over it in, 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 in broad strikes. So, what am I doing here? Um, the input parameters will be a width uh, of the domain and the number of elements. And throughout your development, uh, I want you to keep the number of elements uh, variable. So I want to be able to, to get results uh, also if I change in your code, if I change the number of elements. Then, I'm computing an element stiffness matrix. Where am I doing that? Not right here. So what is an element stiffness matrix in this case? Uh, we have um, our, our square elements, uh, linear degrees of freedom, and the, the equation that we're trying to solve 
looks like. Okay, we'll go back. All right, the beginning, we talked about this. Yeah, okay. Is this equation? Yeah? Because uh, the one dimensional case of this uh, linear elasticity problem uh, has a lot in common with the Poisson equation. So for each of the elements, and we'll, we'll sum over the different elements, we want to compute this contribution to the stiffness matrix. And we'll do that with numerical integration. It's an integral, we'll do numerical integration. So what we're doing is we're, we're uh, looping over all the Gauss points in x and in y. It's a two-dimensional problem. I'm getting the derivative of that, that n vector. And for each of these Gauss points, I will add the multiplication of the derivative of the basis function vector uh, with itself and weighted by the Gauss point weight. Yeah, so this is the integration procedure, looping over Gauss points, adding up different weights. And this part is precisely the part that you see in the bottom. Yeah? So that's precisely the part where you have the derivative of the, of the, the basis function vector. Okay. So I'm doing that once for my element stiffness matrix, and I only have to do that once because uh, all the elements are the same. Now I'm using square elements, uh, all linears, uh, there's no varying material parameter at this point. Uh, so I only have to do this once. So I'm getting one element stiffness matrix. Then I'm, I'm pre-allocating the, the global stiffness matrix, the size for that. So these are the global stiffness matrix right now, they're all zeros. So this is the number of degrees of freedom that we'll have in X and in Y. And after that, I will assemble the global stiffness matrix by going over each of the elements and by adding to the global stiffness matrix now the contribution of each of these elements. And the stuff that's over here, that is about the node ordering. So of course you have to make sure that each of the nodes of the, the element is correctly mapped onto the nodes of the, the global system. Okay, so at that point we have a global stiffness matrix uh, that sort of houses the Poisson equation. Um, we still have to apply boundary conditions. So the way that we're doing that right here is I'm actually going over every single node in our mesh. I will get the coordinates of each of these nodes in that mesh. And then I'm calling a function that says boundary condition. I'm giving that the, x, the, the, the coordinates. And that function is giving me back whether or not it's inside of the, the boundary condition or if the boundary condition is valid and a boundary condition value. And so if we look at that function, So this function boundary condition gets an x and a y position and what it does right here is uh, depending on if, if, if x and y are on the boundary or not, it returns uh, true if, if it's actually in the boundary. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So it returns true if it's actually inside the boundary and then returns a value. Yeah? And in this case apparently I'm using zeros pretty much all around. I think I still changed this code a little bit, so I might send you a, a slightly different version, but the uh, idea stands. So, for each of the nodes, I get the position and I see if that is on the boundary, and then I get a boundary condition. If it is indeed on the boundary, then I'll perform this set of steps. You can look at this in your own time to see what exactly goes on here, but effectively, what I'm doing is I'm moving the effect of the boundary condition to the right hand side, because for that node, uh, the, the value is actually known. So as you can see right here, what I'm doing is, is I'm crossing out the, the row, I'm crossing out the column, and I'm setting a 1 on the diagonal of that node. So on the left we have a stiffness matrix that has a 1 on the diagonal and everything else is, is 0, uh, which means that 
at that point, and then I set the boundary, the value of the boundary condition on the force vector on the right. So at that point, the system of the equation simply says this node multiplied by one is equal to the boundary condition. Yeah, so this is simply setting that node to the boundary condition. And after that, it's a matter of, of solving. And um, yeah, okay, so I'll run this. Oh, probably, yeah. I suspect that given the system setup, it's not going to show you the results. <laughs> so the way that we're streaming this, no, okay, okay. So you're not seeing the results. Um, I'll upload these files. You can run them yourself. The result is, uh, is uh, the solution of a Poisson equation on the square. Um, yeah, okay. You can run it yourself. You can look at what it looks like. Uh, so I also wrote some plotting functions for this. And I'll give you those as well. So in your version of the code, I'll, I'll change this a little bit. So I think I already wrote plotting functions such that um, you only have to add at a very specific location a certain amount of code and that, that should be able to solve the, the, the problem. So I'm highlighting that in the version that I'm sending you. Okay, um, I think that given the limitations of my setup right here, that's all I can show. Um, so I think that's what I'll, I'll, I'll stick with. Um, so what I'll do is I'll upload uh, the project description, I'll upload the version of the code, and uh, well, I suggest that you have a closer look at this code yourself. Uh, of course, reading someone else's code is always a bit tricky. Um, showing code is probably even trickier, so I, I encourage you to have a look at that um, in your own time and get started with the project. So I'll also upload some notifications about how we will handle uh, the project sessions. Yeah? And um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank you for your attendance, and I'll see you on Tuesday.